Good day, everyone. And welcome to our webinar about leveraging AI for plastic pollution detection and monitoring. Sorry for the slight delay due to technical issues here. I think and hope that everyone hears me by now. I'm Carl Heumann from SALT in Norway, and I'm the group manager for Marine Litter. And it's my pleasure to be your host today at this webinar. This event is presented by ICAP, the International Knowledge Hub Against Plastic Pollution. ICAP is dedicated to collecting, critically analyzing, and disseminating scientific knowledge to support effective policies and actions against global plastic pollution. So before we kick off the webinar, just a few important practical notes. Firstly, this webinar is supposed to last one and a half hours max, and uh, it's an initiative by ICAP to foster dialogue and share cutting edge research on AI to tackle plastic pollution. We encourage you all to actively participate and to make this experience interactive, we have a Q&A function enabled. So be, feel free to submit your questions at any time during these presentations today and we will have some time to answer them after each talk and in addition we have a dedicated Q&A session and a panel, panel discussion at the end of today's webinar. Additionally for those who wish to revisit these webinar discussions and share them with colleagues this webinar is being recorded so the recording will be made available through ICAP's website shortly after the event concludes. Now, without further ado, let's delve into today's exciting agenda. We will get our first round of three presentations from, from our speakers, and then we have a Q&A session after each of them. And these Q&As will be by me and my co-moderator, Morten Goodwin. Then we will hear about two interesting cases. And finally, we wrap up with a moderated panel discussion and a Q&A session. As I said, you can all send in questions to this panel debate and we will pick them up as best possible. Now, allow me to introduce my co-moderator and today's first speaker, Professor Morten Goodwin. Professor Morten Goodwin is a leading figure within the field of artificial intelligence from the University of Agder, and uh, he has a secondary professorship at the Oslo Met. He has co-founded AI Experts and serves as the deputy head at the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, as well as being an award winner educator and communicator. Professor Goodwin will talk to us today about the topic harnessing AI for marine research and addressing marine pollution. To provide us a broader introduction and to into the realms of AI and also the potentials within marine applications. So before the following speakers uh, that will uh, dive into specific applications within marine litter. Now over to you, Morten, please take it away. So thank you, Carl, and thank you for inviting me to talk about artificial intelligence and marine research and addressing marine pollution. So I will soon share my screen and you can see my slides, but uh, keep in mind the world of AI is moving rapidly. Uh, this, if you haven't lived under a rock or behind a uh, big pile of grass, you have heard about artificial intelligence. You've heard about chat GPT as one of those artificial intelligences. But AI is much more than the very prominent and very masterfully um, established chat GPT. It has a huge impact in enormous amounts of, uh, in enormous places such as in marine research as well. Uh, and you will now, hopefully you see my screen and you will then see my slide, which says harnessing AI for marine research and addressing pollution. Artificial intelligence is nothing new. It's been established for a long time and about 10 years ago, we were for the first time able to use artificial intelligence for image recognition in a, such a good way that we were able to surpass the human expertise of doing uh, image classification. So it may seem like that not that long ago, but 10, 11 years ago, we were supposed to, uh, there were competitions 
one of them was called ImageNet, based on some ImageNet data. And this was the first time that AI was actually able to see the difference between a cat and a dog or a fish and a starfish, for example, that type of thing. So that's completely different than ChatGPT, and it's completely different than the game playing systems. And now, one of the techniques that's mostly used in, uh, or they're used in, for example, marine research, is what's called object detection, which is also an AI technique. Object detection works so that you have a, an image or a video, and you're able to recognize each uh, object within the image. So here you see an example of object detection, where you have a picture of a seabed, there's fish, obviously. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and there's plastic which is not supposed to be there and based on object te detection techniques such as YOLO, which is one of those AI techniques that is uh, relatively easy to do. So there's very little AI research in object detection. It's now more or less a plug and play tool. And that plug and play tool is available to everyone of you dependent on independent of whether you have uh, ICT background or not. Uh, you could, for example, try a software tool which is called uh, segment editing. And here you see that here you can upload an image. Here I upload an image of a, a glass bottle, uh, obviously, and you can see the it's able to automatically detect the bottle, segment the bottle uh, if you like. Or we can do it a little bit more difficult. You can see here a picture of a rope under, under the sea. A little bit hard to see, but segment editing can do that automatically. So that's just one of enormous amount of tools that does object detection or object segmentation, meaning that you detect objects within an image or a video stream. So what I'm saying is that what used to be researched just a few years ago is now readily available as image tools for anyone who really likes to do that. So that means that you can do it to a website or you can integrate it with uh, some sort of um, underwater robot, for example. Uh, the AI part of this is relatively straightforward. And that's been done many places. For example, this Japanese company uh, Jamstack. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Uh, heard of them? They have a camera on the downside of uh, um, of a drone, underwater drone, and then they use YOLO, this object detection technique, to automatically detect equipment that's not supposed to be under the sea. It is. Uh, readily available to be used for anybody who puts a little bit of effort into this. So there's not AI research in this. It's already established as a technique. I mean, no, this is used a lot in the fish industry in general. For example, in uh, fish farms, uh, detecting the amount of pellets, for example, is something that AI does marvelously already. Uh, that means that in a fish farmer, fish eat pellets, sometimes they don't eat enough because they're sick, for example, AI techniques automatically already do they count the amount of pellets with the same technique. So there's absolutely no reason why the same type of algorithm, same type of method should be, shouldn't be available to, for example, detecting plastic. And a marvelous thing with these techniques is that you can often ask uh, what is the AI thinking in quotation marks. Why is it looking there and not there? And when you do that for pellet detection, for example, you see such things uh, that what part of the image it considers important. And that's fundamental because now we know that the AI system is looking in the correct places where there is pellets or are not pellets or where there is plastic, there are no plastic at all, that type of thing. There's many companies that that utilize this type of method. For Ocean is one such example. Uh, NRK, the uh, national uh, news agency in Norway, use very, very similar AI techniques, not for ocean detection, but for land detection. Can you see the difference between one area that has been built uh, and one area that has not been built based on satellite images? Meaning when 
a journalist group such as NRK is able to use AI for such uh, an important topic, it's obvious to me that the uh, marine research area also has an enormous amount of potential. And we can also look at other areas where that type of technique has been used quite a lot in parts of Africa. There's uh, snipers. We don't want snipers, of course, uh, but with AI techniques uh, together with flying drones, you can look at and count elephants and detect individual elephants. And then every night or every other night or whatever you have resources still, you can fly drones over parts of Africa where you know there are snipers and you can detect which elephants are there and are not. And again, there's no reason why that should be limited to land animals or anything uh, for the industry, also collecting pollution or detecting plastic will be uh, equally easy. A couple of years ago, there was this competition from the data from uh, Purdue. Uh, the competition was held by Kaggle, and the idea was not to uh, not to detect uh, plastic in any way, but to count the amount of algae that uh, that is uh, in um, a lake. Uh, and the AI system was able to do that quite uh, intensively, quite well, and also predict future time for that type of system. So that means that when you try use an AI system to detect what's happening now at the same time as you try to predict in the future, it is quite well established. And easily available. Another example is uh, detecting uh, plankton that should not be in a place in a, in a specific area of the sea. You can use AI for that as well. And then you can again ask, what is this AI thinking? What are the reasoning behind it uh, that you say that there are huge amounts of plankton in this area, for example? And the answer you get out of the AI, the interpretability, as we say uh, in the AI terms, is in this case like this. So here you see the most important part, the most important feature that uh, the AI uses to predict these type of planktons is salinity. The second most important is temperature. The third most important is oxygen and so on and so forth. So the point with this is that when you use an AI system, you can get a high level of accuracy, meaning that you detect plastic or detect a rope or detect uh, a fish farm that should not be like this, something like that, uh, quite easily. But you can also get insight into your uh, data, understanding what is really happening. And for example, saying that oh, maybe we should reduce the temperature because then it uh, becomes better for the fish, for example. This is uh, available to, uh, to anyone who has interest in that type of research. It connects the field of artificial intelligence with the field of marine biology and also with the global goal we all have of helping the marine life. This was a short introduction about uh, how artificial intelligence can really help and support uh, marine biology and uh, pollution. So uh, and I look forward to listening to the rest of the yeah, Thanks a lot, Professor Mortlin Goodwin. That was very interesting. It really gave us uh, a scope of what potential lies within the realms of AI. And we will now dive a little bit deeper into the specific applications of marine litter when it comes to using AI. So please let's, let me introduce our first speaker after Morten Goodwin, who is also, will also participate uh, um, with us as the, the moderator. Uh, so our next speaker is Morten Rob, uh, sorry, Robin Devry, uh, who is the product lead of ADIS at the Ocean Cleanup. And the A ADIS stands for Automated Debris Imaging System. Since joining the Ocean Cleanup in 2018, Robin has been developing and testing technologies for detection and mapping of plastic litter. In addition to using satellite data, he's pioneering the application of UAVs and camera systems. And uh, DeVries holds a master's degree in geoscience and remote sensing from Delft University. Robin, you will present on using artificial intelligence to map flo floating plastic in the ocean. So please welcome Robin DeVries. The virtual floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Carl. Um, well, and thank you for the excellent introduction. Um, so let's start off quickly. This uh, background image is actually a uh, photo that we have taken um, over the uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the Pacific Ocean by a drone, uh, where we have done drone surveys to well to map floating as plastic in the ocean. So I thought it would be relevant um, as a good start. Uh, let's first introduce a little bit because you might be wondering uh, who we are. So the Ocean Cleanup, right? Uh, we are based in the Netherlands in, in Rotterdam. Um, and by now we are uh, 150 employees. We were founded uh, in 2012. And since then we've been developing and scaling technologies to rid the world's oceans of plastic. Um, I can definitely say that 2023 was our most impactful year. Um, and you can see some examples to the right. So, so uh, our system three has been successful in cleaning up uh, literal tons of plastic out of the ocean. Uh, and at the same time, we've also done our very best in stopping uh, plastics from reaching the ocean in the first place by deploying what we call our interceptor technology, uh, which is by now a, uh, a range of solutions to uh, stop plastic from entering the oceans. Uh, where I think our most successful project might have been the the one in Guatemala, where um, uh, a, a, a trash tsunami, so so to speak, occurs that we uh, stop from happening uh, periodically. So that's the background in which I work in in the ocean cleanup. Um, a little bit about myself: who am I? Uh, I joined the ocean cleanup in 2018, and um, I have a background in well, as Carl already introduced. Uh, geomatics, remote sensing, geodesy, and aerospace engineering. Um, since the, the joining of the Ocean Cleanup, I've been working on re relevant remote sensing solutions for the Ocean Cleanup. Uh, so really looking what is the intersection of really interesting scientific work, but also what is relevant for the Ocean Cleanup to work with. Um, and my job has mainly been focusing on you know, ocean remote sensing in that way. Um, we're developing something that we call the ADIS, the Automated Debris Imaging System. And you can see a technical sketch down below in the slide, uh, which is actually a compact camera, which we uh, which we will deploy on vessels going globally. I will explain a little bit more further down the presentation. Of course, I will be um, giving also a bit more inter general introduction into AI for, for the ocean. So um, basically, I, I sometimes try to oversimplify the field a little bit and, and maybe tying back into Morton's introduction about what is AI and what can it do. I I personally drew up this some time ago where I think in the end, it, it always comes down into converting um, uh, observations into predictions in the end. So basically that's sort of the core of every AI, even G chat GPT is you train it, you you put it into some sort of model, and then by some point, the model starts to be able to, to make either detections or predictions into the future. Sometimes scientists also call these detections predictions as a sort of jargon. So if I may, I'll just um, highlight a few uh, concepts because I, I really like to look at, at it as a mirror between um, classical statistics and AI. So in, in the classical statistics, what you have is to usually you have numerical data. Uh, you do things like linear regression, iterative estimation, and outcomes, for example, trend and forecast. Uh, so you do this by least squares adjustments and then making a prediction. So this is kind of the, the, the old school way of doing things. And then uh, when we talk about the model, we often talk about parameters and the parameters themselves can be quite interesting, such as sea level change rates or uh, temperature change rates. In, in terms of the climate, um, then we uh, here comes the, the field of AI, where actually I see the parallels like this, and it I don't know maybe it helps you to to mirror this and to um, to to play around with the concepts in your in your mind, uh, where basically the observations we mostly deal with are images and labels or videos and labels, but of course this can also be text. Um, the model now we call more like a neural network. It's basically a, a way more advanced version of the same thing uh, in a way with linear regression. You cannot just do the same mathematical operation anymore to, to estimate the model. You have to do different things for that. We call it training. Uh, but in the end, the prediction sort of mirror is then the detected objects, classified images or generated images even 
or in the chat GPT case, generate text. So we call it training or deep learning when we uh, create the model um, and, and we call it inference when we predict things out of it. So it's a, it's a way of, of looking at things where I, I started going into this field and I thought, well, actually with my background, I can sort of understand, I don't have to do uh, you know, the, 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 the whole coding of the model. I can actually understand what is going on here on a larger level. So basically before you start coding an AI or, or making one, I, I, I think it is relevant to ask yourself what is sort of the, the phenomenon we, we need to detect and what, what kind of observations are relevant for that. So what sensor technology? Uh, so to the right here, you can see an example of a phenomenon called windrows in the ocean. Uh, these are high density uh, accumulations of plastic debris together with organic waste. They often occur in, in coastal zones. And so there are, these are very relevant targets for, for object detection or uh, segmentation from space actually. And I, I believe we will see some applications down the, further down the line of this webinar. But on the other side um, of things, you also have things like individual items. Um, and they are they are also relevant in a way. So this is of course a very different kind of scenario or environment to detect than than the one to the right. So um, I also sometimes tell myself, do you really need an AI for that? Sometimes you can actually do it maybe simpler way uh, that is even uh, more computationally light. And in the end, very importantly, I find how how do you transform it into something that's understandable by a human or can be used in a scientific way because uh, if you detect an object in this video, it's very nice, but how do you, what does it mean? Um, and, and how do you really make it into something that you can then uh, get numbers out and put on the map, for example? So there's a bit of post-processing, you could say. Um, so for us at the at the Ocean Cleanup, in terms of observations, um, if I were to, to choose between those windrows, which are actually kind of low hanging fruit and those unique items, we would actually go for those unique individual items. Now, why is that? Um, it is because in the open ocean where we, where we try to extract uh, the plastics from the, the garbage patch, the concentration of plastic isn't actually that high. So the scenario that you saw in a movie clip is actually the one that is the predominant one. Uh, actually, we, we have never seen uh, windrows out in the open ocean. And that appears to be our uh, operating scenario. So we, we will have to deal with that, that fact. So to the right here, what you can see is basically a prediction chart of the, the, the accumulation of plastic. So the red zones here are high concentration zones and you can see the track of system, uh, the cleanup system being forecast through it. So this is the way that we try to uh, utilize predictions and uh, and detections to to also optimize the root efficiency uh, of our cleanup system. And the other use case is that, as you can see here on the bottom plot, the uh, unfortunately the, the the amount of plastics in the ocean is still ever increasing, and it's doing so exponentially. So. We are basically in the in the search for a tool that can be used uh, as a, as a monitoring tool for establishing trends. We've tried a lot of things in terms of the observation side. So here you can basically see an intersection between the type of platforms that we've used and the type of sensors that we've explored for this specific application in in the open ocean, right? So um, we've we've basically flown drones. We've tried looking at satellite data with hyperspectral laser and multispectral data. Um, and they are they all have their, their pros and cons. But what really stands out for us is um, the uh, optical data, so RGB uh, visual photos. Why is that? Um, basically, when, when we try to look at our observation use case, uh, I think there are two things at play that uh, make it important for us to choose technologies. One of them is the scalability of the technology. So can we actually put it on many different platforms? Um, how expensive is it to collect data so far out in the ocean? What is the easiest way that we can get a sensor into the ocean there? So ships are a very obvious um, opportunity there. And the other side of the equation, in our opinion, is the, the ability to detect individual plastic items, right? So. Is the resolution fine, fine enough that we can at least detect a single ghost net or a single bucket out there? 
Um, and uh, it, it appears so that that uh, optical cameras for us RGB data uh, has shown sort of the 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 most consistent quality and and reliability there. So I Robin, would like to just yeah. just a quick comment, Robin. Uh, if you're sure. going for a landing within a minute, please. Yeah, I'm almost uh, done. So thanks, uh, Carl. Um, so I just want to highlight our uh, concept of the ADIS here, uh, which is uh, a, a camera that can be uh, plugged in very easily on a ship, um, and uh, it makes use of the fact that uh, the entire world is traversed by by ships um, going from port to port, and it, it it collects data along the way. So basically, the data that you get out is is object detection. And these object detections can tell us a lot. In the end, we can put them on the map like this, uh, as you can see here on the bottom left. And an example of the detections are shown here to the right. Um, so um, basically, we make use of smart onboard processing so that uh, data doesn't have to be all transferred, that we only transfer what's called the detections themselves. My final slide then, I want to summarize, um, I think, I've simplified artificial intelligence as a tool to create predictions. The type of observations matters greatly, and different environments, as you can see, require different types of observations and different AI models. Uh, the ocean cleanup, we have ex a unique exposure to open uh, ocean, and that offers uh, opportunities to do this smart in situ monitoring, as I call it. Um, so we are exploring several options for that. Um, and we are planning to uh, do the first unsupervised deployments of our ADIS in, in this year, in 2024. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Robin. That was really interesting and sorry for interrupting. Uh, we're no lagging worries. a little bit behind the schedule, but I think we have time for a quick question. If you have anything you would add uh, as a question, Morten. Yeah, sure. I can, uh, we can, I can ask uh, at least uh, one question here. So. Uh, you, you you showed very different ways to do image analysis, RGB, hyperspectral, etc. So I, I've used uh, hyperspectral data uh, for uh, land analysis before, and what you do is you kind of add it at top of the RGB. But but still, you said that it was not the best because you put it as a competitor to the RGB data. Uh, so mm. how come the adding hyperspectral data yeah, does not improve the results? What's well, I think first of all, you're you're exactly right. So you can definitely make use of hyperspectral on top of the RGB. Uh, I think what's also something that I didn't mention is that we, as the ocean cleanup, we, we do try to uh, work with sort of the cheapest options out there. Yeah. And unfortunately, hyperspectral sensors are also uh, very costly, especially okay. when you want to yeah. operate them in a marine environment uh, yeah. and to to have several hundreds of them. Um, so that's a bit like it's it's not a a hard unsuitable or suitable. It's more yeah. like a spectrum. Uh, what I mean. I that makes a lot of sense. So I, okay. if I may, I can ask a second question. You talked about wind, sure. which makes a lot of uh, has a, much impact for you. Uh, and uh, you maybe you've seen some of the AI based wind prediction systems. For example, DeepMind has a big one uh, called mm -hmm. uh, um, Now Casting that can predict. Mm -hmm quite well in the next 90 minutes. Would such a wind prediction system be helpful to you? Because then you don't, have, don't it's very hard to know the temperature and the weather of the wind long into the future, but it seems that AI could help a lot there. Would that be a uh, assistance to your type of system? Yeah, yes, uh, Morten, I, I certainly think so. And, and as you also said in your presentation that the the, the development are going so rapidly that we are uh, we sometimes are one step behind uh, yeah. with the status quo. So I can I can totally imagine that uh, such a model will be uh, yeah will be an improvement to our, our way of route, routing and and forecasting. So are there any questions from the Q and A, Carl? There is a bunch of questions actually, and I think we uh, have to save <laughs> some of them for the panel discussion later due to the interest of time. But I'm sure that we can come back to some of the questions from the audience. I'm glad to see them jumping in here. So thanks a lot to Robin from the Ocean Cleanup. We'll see you again soon. Um, and next up is our speaker, Robrecht Mullins from uh, uh, Vito. 
He is an R&D professional in remote sensing in the section of water and coast at VITU. And Mr. Mullins holds a master's degree in mining and geotechnical engineering from the KU Leuven, Belgium University. Uh, before starting to work at V2 Remote Sensing in 2018, he was active for several years on projects in land and on marine geophysics. Uh, and in remote sensing, he has developed an operational workflow in the cloud to process raw UAV images, images uh, to create site overview maps, to monitor turbidity and chlorophyll A, both for coastal and inland waters. And next to this, he was working on projects for the detection of oil spills inside of port environments. More recently, he started to work on detection of litter objects on rivers and riverbanks and how this information can be condensed into summarizing parameters such as litter flux or hotspot maps. So, Robrecht, we really look forward now to hear your presentation about AI-based hotspot mapping, mapping and quantification of plastic flux in rivers. Over to you, Robrecht. Thank you for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me. We hear you. Perfect. If you can please expand the screen. There we go. Now we see the screen. Yeah. Um, so my presentation uh, will be about uh, high resolution uh, RGB images acquired from bridges and UAVs. So I will not talk about satellite images. Um, and um, only about, I will only consider macro litter uh, on rivers and river banks. So I will not focus on the, on the oceans. Uh, so the two main parts are the litter on land and the floating litter. I just briefly uh, mentioned here what are the some important differences. So for the litter on land, uh, we focus on producing hotspot maps or uh, getting densities of uh, of litter. For floating litter, we count in fact the the number of floating items per time, and that's what we call a flux. Litter on land, that the scene is more static. Uh, land is not uh, moving. Um, so we need a mobile camera to, to monitor a certain area, while on water, on rivers, uh, in fact, the river is flowing, so the water is moving. It's a very dynamic environment, and therefore here we will use uh, bridge uh, data, uh, cameras installed on bridges. Uh, also on land, you have a more variation in the background, while on water, okay, yeah, water can also make some differences. But uh, I think there are the, the challenges to have a proper camera setup and installation. I will now first focus on the, the floating litter part and then later on the litter on land. So uh, before to start uh, talking about AI and the processing, I just want to mention uh, a word about the acquisition because uh, we will spend more time in uh, setting everything up, acquiring data, annotating data, and so on often it's often more time consuming compared to deploying or uh, the deploying the, the AI model. So close to our head office, we have a, a, a canal and there we uh, have a, a setup, temporary setup, which we can take off and install. We can test uh, different cameras, which is uh, shown here. Um, and uh, it's also easy, in fact, to do some, uh, for example, releasing catch uh, uh, experiments. So to generate uh, training data. Uh, it's also good for concept testing. Uh, and this we used, in fact, this setup to uh, define protocols. And these are uh, condensed into uh, a document uh, which is available in the Horizon Europe uh, project, which I show you some, some links here below on social media and the website. Uh, it's a Horizon Europe uh, project that started in uh, by the end of May uh, last year. Uh, and it's not only about detecting plastic, but also to take the plastic out and uh, public awareness. So it's a very large, it's 26 partners inside the project. Um, and there are the protocols, they are not yet published, but they soon will be. So, and then to go from a test setup to an operational setup, it's uh, somewhat different. So within the Inspire project, we will have to monitor three uh, large rivers in Europe, which was shown at the top right. Um, and in fact, to go from uh, a test setup with one camera close to your office for half a day to uh, multiple cameras uh, for months, several months of monitoring far from your office, it's uh, somewhat different. So you need to in 
take into account uh, all these things here about yeah, your equipment must be robust. You have to take into account the cost because uh, the projects are they have foreseen a certain budget for that. You need power supply, remote connection, and so on. Everything must be stable. So I just wanted to mention this because it's an important step. If you have, uh, have a good uh, acquisition of data, uh, you have a better chance that your AI model is also better in detecting. So once we have uh, made the setup and we acquire uh, the data, of course, we need to, the first step is to detect uh, the plastic uh, on water. Uh, what we uh, use so far is a faster RCNN uh, model. It's a kind of neural network, which is relatively old. I think it was published in 2015. Um, and we use the Detectron 2 platform from Meta AI. Um, it's an old uh, model, as I said, but uh, in fact, it does the job uh, as uh, far as we've seen. So we have get very good results uh, with the model. Um, sometimes, uh, as I said, some false positives uh, if the water surface is less homogeneous. So on the figure on the left, you see that the water is uniform, homogeneous. It's grayish brown. Um, but that's not always the case, and that makes it sometimes a bit more difficult that you get uh, false positives. Uh, for instance, here at the bottom left, you see some uh, cloud uh, shadows, shadows from the trees, or here you see some varying uh, light conditions that can sometimes make it a bit harder. But there is a solution just to uh, annotate more data, so to increase your, your training data set to um, to incorporate that and that the model learns that it is not uh, plastic he is looking for. So to, to transform the, the individual uh, plastics into a plastic flux, so I mentioned the plastic flux is how many plastic objects are passing per unit of time on the river. Uh, we need of course to have data of that river and to cover the complete width of the uh, of the river, so we need a sufficient amount of, of uh, cameras. Uh, and it's also important to take into account uh, some site-specific conditions, like for instance, tide. Uh, the Scheldt River in Belgium, I think there's a tide difference of seven, eight meters. Uh, the footprint of your uh, camera will change with the tide. So you must make sure when you install the cameras that there is enough overlap between the foot, uh, footprints of the, of the images. So we have to detect then the plastic object in individual images, which is, was shown in the previous slide. And then the hard step here for the plastic flux is to recognize the same object in different images. So why would there be uh, the same object in different images? Due to the wind, for example, due to current. The current is also changing, especially with, uh, with tide. With the frame rate, uh, you need to have sufficient amount of images, and often there are duplicates uh, when you compare different images. So all these need to, uh, to be taken into account and that the objects you detect, that you don't count it multiple times because if you have multiple objects multiple times, your error rate is also uh, higher. So there are classical ways to do that, uh, to look into the color of the uh, objects, the shape of the objects. But um, uh, here is a, an example of a, a plastic flux, which we took also at the test setup. So uh, you have different images here, a time lapse of the different images. Um, and uh, you see, for example, the rope is more stable. It's it's not moving so much, but the white bottle, it's moving a lot uh, and turning around. So the idea is to in detect each individual object and to avoid counting it uh, multiple times. So as I said, we can use the classical ways for that, but uh, I just wanted to show you now the uh, uh, a new way, uh, which is based on the segment anything, which was already uh, discussed by Morten. Uh, so, and here's the personalized segment anything. So, segment anything is a foundation model. It's a very large model, a lot of parameters trained on a lot of data, different data. I think it's 11 million uh, images. And it's for different downstream applications. And here, one application is a personalized segment editing, uh, which was published last year. And the idea is, is uh, shown here on the on the right. If you have, uh, then the user has to provide one image with one mask of the dog, uh, and then you can apply the model, and the model is able to detect the, the same dog uh, at lying on the ground or swimming in the water uh, due to only this mask. And then, of course, the segment editing uh, capabilities. So I applied the same thing to uh, to the image which was shown previously. So we want to, to detect the same bottle in the different images. 
So this is what I provided to the to the model. So you have the RGB image, and then you have here the mask of the bottle. And then I applied the model, and he was able to track the same bottle in the different images. So even if it's touching the other one, he's uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, separating it and uh, to track it. So in that way, we can use it to um, to count. In fact, uh, this is one bottle passing by by the river. So that's Robert, the idea behind it. Yeah. If you could please wrap up within a minute, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. I will just uh, talk briefly about the data acquisition on land. So here is an image taken in Vietnam where you have different backgrounds, uh, where you see that uh, the background is different with sand and grass. Uh, yeah, we applied a, a simple model, a ResNet 50 model, but maybe I will jump to the Last one, we try to do apply it uh, to to ask ChatGPT if there is plastic in the different images, and it's really impressive uh, what it gives. So he's able to see here uh, that there is no plastic, and then he says here's uh, some plastic object. Even if there are flowers uh, in the image, he says there are flowers. There's no plastic. Here he says there is plastic. So and I think the uh, it is because it's trained on so much data that he's capable of detecting. Uh, the, the, the paving stones, the grass, and so on. And when there's an anomaly, like uh, plastic, which he was not specifically trained on, he's able to, to get it out. So this shows also that the large models that become more available are in fact uh, really promising in terms of uh, plastic detection and litter detection. And this is then a heat map, the end product of a typical uh, land survey. This was my presentation, yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, and uh, that was really interesting. And I haven't seen any questions specifically for your talk now, Robert, but I can see that there are, are questions about riverine systems and detecting plastic in, in rivers from the talk of Robin. So maybe have a look in the Q&A, Robert, then we can come back to this question later and maybe unite uh, you and, and Robin about this one. Um, Morten, yeah. do you have any question to Robert? Yeah, I can shoot in a quick question here. So you talked you talked about a lot of interesting stuff, but for you talked also about uh, the the potential of false positives. So how, uh, which is can happen a lot in many models, including faster RCNN, obviously. But uh, how how detrimental, how bad is it with false positives? Is that an, does it have an impact at all in your um, system? Uh, the false positives we get are typically uh, white foam, the, the, the light, if there's sunlight reflecting on it, uh, turbidity plumes that passing by, all those kind of things. So uh, I think there's uh, there must be a way to, to improve it, just to to increase also the number of data because the, the litter itself, it's also a very high variation on litter. Eh? So you have weathering or not, you have uh, the, the, the colors, the, it's a really, really large uh, uh, variety, so you need to have a lot of data also to incorporate. But I think uh, step by step you can quickly increase to avoid that. Mm. But 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 what what is the what is the imp impact of your system if you get a false positive? The, the it will collect a bit too much plastic, but the plastic isn't there, so it it may not have a yeah. big negative impact at all. I'm you sure. count you count more more plastic than yeah yeah okay exactly. that, uh, yeah. there is yeah that's the impact yeah. yeah okay thank you thanks a lot Wilbert and uh, Morten. We will move on to our last two speakers. Um, so first of them is Dr. Donald Hill, who is the co-founder and chief technical officer at Plastic Eye. And Donald holds a PhD in particle physics from the University of Oxford, and he has a decade of experience from CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. At Plastic Eye, Dr. Hill oversees all aspects of technological uh, development, including the use of satellite satellite data and AI. He will today provide a case study shedding light on the technological aspects of plastic pollution detection. Um, I should also add that Donald is a senior data scientist at the Swiss data center in Lausanne in Switzerland, and he assists a broad range of industry partners with their adoption of AI. So Donald, now we really look forward to hear more about Plastic Eye and your technology. Please welcome. Is Donald here? 
I can see Donald in the list, but I can't hear or see Donald. Hi, folks. I, I've been blocked from uh, sharing my camera and mic. I'm not sure why, but now I'm uh, I'm coming back to life again. Um, I was there you are. frantically sending messages you. in the chat. <laughs> I'm very much here. Sorry about that, folks. Let me just I, I also need some share permissions, if you don't mind, so I can share the slides. I think I was changed to an attendee. Not sure what happened there. Um, so then I lost my. Uh, <laughs> I no, see. My, my I share button is disabled, in the so background. I, I might need to. Do you want to do the other speaker first, and I'll mm -hmm. hop off and rejoin, just in the interest of time? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's happened on on the tech side. I might need to sure, rejoin to get the to get the, the permissions. Uh, so D writes in the chat now that it should work now. Should be able to share now. Uh, so let's as have of a try right now, my my share button has has come back to life. Yes. <laughs> Good. All right, it's all yours. That's very good. Excellent. Can you see a PowerPoint? Hopefully we can, can confirm that, Carl. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, let's get started then. So thank you very, very much for, for the, the kind invitation. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to, to listen to, to so many insightful talks and, and join you this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of, of what we're up to at Plastic Eye. Um, and to start off, let's confirm what our, our company mission is, which I think will align with, with many people on the call. It's, it's really to, to help look after the marine environment, uh, to share a stable and, and just one with future generations, it's something we can all get behind. And our focus as a business is to try and be a bridge to effective solutions. So we're, we're well aware of problems uh, in the domain of, of plastic pollution um, and water systems, but we're also aware of effective solutions as well. We've, we've heard talk from Robin, for example, on, on interceptors. So what we want to do is, is help bridge the gap between well-known problems and their solutions by providing actionable data and reporting uh, on a regular basis. And uh, in order to do that, we're developing a product which provides measurement, reporting and verification services, so MRV. Um, ultimately, it's a software as a service platform that ingests satellite imagery and applies uh, novel AI techniques to automate the detection and monitoring of, of marine debris. For example, here you see a a long accumulation of, of floating debris off the coast of the Isle of May in Scotland in 2018. It's actually longer than the island itself. So it's it's these sorts of objects that we've been focusing on primarily, which are generally accumulations of, of natural and anthropogenic waste. So I'll, I'll talk you through how we do that um, in the talk. We can also monitor change over time because satellites have regular overpass rates and we have access to up to 10 years in some cases of archived data. So we're also able to, to measure time dependent change, look at baselines and, and also potentially measure uh, the impact of interventions at a local level. If you make a policy change such as an interceptor, do you measure um, subsequent changes in, in the debris rate? Um, we can also look at forecasting and hindcasting um, to try and track litter from, from source to destination. You want to try and understand ultimately if there are you know, geographical hotspots that that are causing um, this problem more than others and, and try to do something about it on the ground ultimately. So the way Plastic Eye have gone about this is to use satellite data, um, which is also known as remote sensing. Um, briefly, what you want to do is look at light coming off the Earth and use it to measure various properties of Earth. Um, so you can measure all sorts of things. I, I won't get into the, the long list, but people have done many uh, amazing things with, with satellite data. We focus on the ocean and coastal regions specifically. There are two types of satellite in general, passive and active. Passive is where you use the sun uh, as a torch and it shines light off the earth and you look at the, the reflected light to tell you something about what's going on. There are also active sensors where you send a beam of, for instance, radio waves and you measure what bounces back and, and you can learn a lot from that as well. There are two types of orbit. Geostationary is this red one, which kind of spins around as the Earth spins around. That's very good for telecommunications. The other style is where the, uh, the satellite sort of carves out slices around the Earth as it rotates, and, and that can give you full global coverage. And the more satellites you put up there, the, the better the, the revisit time. So this type of polar orbit is, is what we exploit at Plastic Eye to give us global coverage. Now, in terms of detecting floating debris, what matters is the unique 
signal of debris on the ocean surface compared to you know the surrounding water type and also different types of backgrounds like ships um, and what what works in practice is not to look at any one color in the electromagnetic spectrum but to exploit all the different wavelengths all the different colors that the satellite sees in so this is a graph of the the 13 colors that the uh, the ESA Sentinel-2 satellite sees in and in fact um, you get a lot of rich information on um, floating debris accumulations through the, the near infrared and, and shortwave infrared here. Um, so not just looking at the, the colors that our eyes see. And through um, clever combinations of these wavelength bands, it's called feature engineering, people have made indices that are that are more sensitive to uh, floating debris and, and vegetation um, compared to just looking at each band individually. Now, going beyond feature engineering, you can also think about cutting edge methods in, in deep learning where you use an algorithm to figure out the best combination of data for your particular use case. So in our case, detecting floating debris. Computer vision is, is really the, the computer analog of human vision, where we have some objects. We have a detector, which is our eye, passes it to some computer processor, our brain, and it spits out some object detection classification on the right-hand side here. For computer vision, the, the analog is, is really close. You have some sort of sensing device um, which passes it to a computational interpreting device, in this case, the computer vision model, and you spit uh, out an output on the other side, which you, you hope is correct. So for our use case, input would be satellite data of, of regions of water. Um, the interpreting device is our deep learning model, which I'll explain more in the next couple of slides. And the output then is a, is a debris probability map. So showing, according to the computer vision model, where floating debris is more or less likely in a given satellite image. Um, now, the model we use to do this, we've we've already seen lots of lovely segmentation going on with with the uh, the SAM model. We use a very similar architecture that we that we custom build and train ourselves. It's based on uh, the UNAT principle, which I'll explain in a minute. But just to reaffirm, the the real benefits of of segmentation are that you get really rich, detailed boundaries between different types of object in an image, not just these crude bounding boxes. So, for example, in this road traffic scene. You can see different classes with, with great detail segmentation masks uh, that the model has pulled out. And to do this, you can leverage both the spectral and spatial structure of your data. Um, so here we have color and the spatial correlation between neighboring pixels that can help us to get these detailed object, object boundaries. And in addition to that, not just the boundary, but within a given object, you actually get a pixel probability for, for every single pixel uh, in the object. The way it works in practice, is through this this UNAP model. It's called a U because it's sort of similar to the the U shape in the alphabet. The first half of the network is what we call the encoder phase, which works to squeeze an input satellite image down to a, a very condensed. Um, we call it a latent space representation, which then is used as your feature set to help predict the class of each pixel uh, when you blow the image back up again on the right hand side. So it turns out that this process of squeezing and stretching the data back up again is, is actually really excellent at, um, at understanding general patterns in, in complicated image data. And people have done many use cases, not only with cats and dogs, uh, but also satellite data for segmenting out, you know, all sorts of, of object classes. Um, here is a typical example of the sort of object we see uh, out in the open ocean. This is a, an EU-sized human being there in the, in the yellow square for reference. The red square is showing you a large um, debris accumulation. So these these long slicks tend to form across ocean fronts, and inside them there's there's very often a mixture of of natural debris like sargassum and driftwood, along with anthropogenic waste in there as well. So our first port of call is to detect globally and in an automated fashion these types of structures and to, and to track them over time. Um, getting into particular single object classification, as, as Robin mentioned, um, becomes very challenging due to the spatial resolution of the satellite. And I think that's where a blend of, of multiple sensors and multiple technologies will, will really pay dividends for, for this problem longer term. But just to show you how this works for us in practice, we take some satellite data on the left. This is the RGB of, of an ocean front. You see differences in color and salinity here. These types of fronts are, are very good at accumulating debris. In this instance, we have ground truth validation um, from, from vessels and, and also news reports of, of debris accumulations on the specific date that the satellite passed over. 
So we can train our algorithm on, on many examples of these types of accumulations, and then we can spit out predictions having not used the ground truth. So in this particular instance, we see a model prediction that is doing a pretty good job um, at, at lining up with the ground truth here. Um, and that gives us confidence that, you know, this will generalize to, to other data that it hasn't seen before. For example, this area in Ghana that was imaged in, in March 2022, um, so this is a debris probability map of, of a very large um, strip of coastline off the coast of Ghana. In purple is where we have a very low debris probability. And then you see these, these streaky um, hot colors in blue, which is actually where the, the UNAP model has segmented out um, with very high probability floating debris uh, on this particular date. So this is the type of map that we can now generate um, in an automated fashion, both for archive data and data as it as it moves, you know, into into our um, data processing stream in, in in real time. That lets us look through historical archives. For example, here we we have a time series of detections made um, in Loch Foyle in Northern Ireland, about half an hour from from where I grew up. Lots of cloud, obviously, but our models are able to segment those out as well. And you see highlighted in yellow um, debris streaks that are found. And and if you lay those all on top of each other, you can make things like cumulative debris maps which tend to show up, you know, flow patterns in a particular area um, and give you a better idea of the kind of um, overall time series behavior in, in a particular region of interest. So that's quite nice. On top of that, another area of development we're looking into with, um, with an intern, Jacob, who's done some fabulous work on predicting debris movement. So once you've made a detection, that's one thing, but actually you want to know where it's going to go. Is it going to wash up on the shore? Is it going to drift five kilometers? A cleanup operator would need to know where to intercept this material in, in due course to, to actually um, have an effective cleanup. So one can couple your initial detection with uh, wind and current models to help predict future debris location. And when you do that, it's, it's sort of like the blobs you see on the weather forecast on the TV. You can build these contours which come from uh, uncertainties, not only on your, your debris detection, but also the uh, the finite resolution of the, the current and the wind data. So you end up with this blob and the blob tends to, to grow in size as you as you move further and further in time. Um, so we're now going to try and validate this um, technology using uh, high revisit time satellite imagery. And, and you know, we hope that we can put a blob where uh, an object has actually drifted to um, in order to validate this tech. One last thing I'll share with you before wrapping up is, is that debris detections are, are one thing, but you probably want to understand patterns and seasonality um, in terms of weather and, and what's going on in, in, in the region that you're that you're looking at. So we did a small case study of um, debris detections off the west coast of Scotland, looking all the way back to the beginning of the Sentinel-2 archive in 2017. So you can see broad seasonal peaks and dips in, in the debris pattern um, in, in Scotland. What's interesting is that when you pull in rainfall data for for the same region, you also see strong seasonality patterns. So actually, some parts of Scotland do get less rain than others uh, uh, during the year, which was which was nice. This graph wasn't just flat and very high. But what you can see is that there's a there, there's a lag between debris peaks and, and seasonal rainfall peaks. So so we're hoping that we can you know make use of external data beyond the satellite imagery itself to help inform uh, our picture of, of, of what's going on um, to give us more detail and, and eventually try to fold this kind of external information into our uh, deep learning modeling as well. So I'll just sum up then. I, I feel like you're all pretty convinced by this, I hope, by the end of today's webinar, but remote sensing across satellites and, and drones and cameras on ships, I, I think is really key um, for tackling plastic pollution in a data-driven and objective way. And you can unlock the potential of that wonderful data using AI-powered tools such as such as computer vision. Um, our tool aims to be global because we have global coverage of satellites, scalable because we build uh, on AWS Cloud, and automated in the sense that you don't need humans to look through all this imagery in order to generate predictions and forecasts. This is this is why we build um, predictive frameworks, as, as, as Morton was mentioning. Um, we also have historical archive capabilities because of the, um, the rich satellite archives that are available to us and, and forecast capability, as I've said, using um, wind and current data to, to propagate your detections forward in time. Um, so we hope that 
um, these tools can can prove useful in in the fight against uh, plastic pollution. So thanks very much for for listening. Thanks so much, Donald, and I'm sure that uh, this will be a great tool for moving forward for tackling marine plastic pollution. And I hope we can get back to questions about segmentation modeling, uh, either in the panel or maybe even now. Morten, what do you say? Do you have any questions to Donald? I can shoot a quick question. It's uh, again a very interesting presentation and talk. And talk. Uh, you, you briefly mentioned that you get your ground truth from among other vessels and of, as we all know getting the ground truth for training these unit models or whatever models is essential so how much work is put into collecting the ground truth and how dependent yeah. are you on these vessels indeed so we've we've leveraged um a lot of open source work here from from two two open data sets that were uh, wonderfully curated by by collaborators and partners one's called merida the other one's called um isa phi lab um, so these were rather painstakingly sifted through using not only Sentinel data, but also high resolution um, planet data as well for, for cross-referencing. Um, I think they were very strict in terms of their um, choice of whether to include, you know, a particular date and a particular example within the validated training set. On top of that, we've now started to sift through all of the labeled open source data sets and, and decide you know, based on our best judgment, um, whether whether these are appropriate examples or not. And then on top of that, build in background classes such as wake trails from planes and, and ships and um, cloud and keys. So, you know, structures such as harbors that generally tend to be yep. straight lines. So um, for these supervised models, it's key, but we're also exploring self-supervised um, oh, yeah. methods and, and trying to exploit lab based um, spectral measurements of different species to try and do as much, you know, label free uh, right. machine learning as we can. But that's uh, that's work in progress. <laughs> exactly. And you, you could potentially also explore uh, anomaly detection methods because then you can just look at yeah. is there any difference between the ocean now and now? And yes, the difference is. Pollution. Absolutely. So so if you can turn um, a unit into an auto encoder yeah. um, without too much trouble, you just change the the labels with the image itself um, on the right hand side. And that's one area that we do want to explore, trying to basically learn the general um, spatial and spectral properties of the ocean um, and then flag images as outliers based on that. So, yeah, Very interesting. a lot more work to do. <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. OK, finally, we want to present our last speaker for today, Dr. Klaus Pauli. He is working as an R&D professional in remote sensing and photogrammetry at VITU. Klaus is a PhD holder in biology from Ghent University in 2011, and he used remote sensing to augment traditional scuba surveys on seaweed. Klaus has then worked on various pioneering projects, including the Belgian unmanned aircraft manufacturer Gatewing and at VITU, focusing on drone-based hyperspectral imaging. Uh, and Dr. Polly, he will present to us today the Waste Watchers project for which he is the project manager. So Klaus, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Thank you for the nice introduction and the uh, uh, impressive organization of this webinar. Thank you. Um, OK, so yeah, my story is a little bit more uh, operational. It's uh, about the question of how to bring all of this to um, to the wider public. Uh, um, from all of the techniques we've discussed today, we've seen that it's very important to somehow um, operationalize this to get uh, a lot of data, uh, especially to build our maps to inform um, cleanup organizations. So yeah, we need a lot of data, first of all, to train the AI models, um, but we also need, um, uh, yeah, uh, eventually once the AI models uh, have been trained and are operational, we also need uh, a lot of data to, to roll them out and to build up effective, uh, effective maps. One way to do that is with satellite imagery, as you've uh, seen in the previous presentation. Uh, but if you uh, speak about drones, uh, the situation becomes a little bit uh, more difficult. And so what I would like to present is um, the citizen science, a citizen science project where we uh, engaged uh, yeah, the wider public to help us in, in collecting uh, image material, formulate questions, um, uh, help us in labeling, um, et cetera, which is one way to, uh, to operationalize all of this and, and scale it up. Now, when we contact the wider audience, it's always very important to engage them uh, with, with appealing stories. And, um, 
uh, one such uh, image that we uh, regularly use is the one you've, uh, you see coming up on the screen right now. And uh, so we use this type of uh, images. This one, by the way, is created by our partner organization, uh, River Cleanup. And we use these images to inform them in a very visual and appealing way. Uh, we see that uh, the plastic problem, it's a widely known problem. But not all of the uh, people are uh, aware uh, what the extent of the problem really is and, and what the associated uh, costs are. So we make sure we have these uh, visuals ready in our communication uh, with the wider audience. Another type of image here is this one. It's um, yeah, the, the project I'm talking about was a Flemish project, a regional project in, in Flanders in Belgium. Um, and so this image is really recognizable uh, to these people. It's a an image of the uh, of, of the riverbank along the river Scheldt in in, uh, in Flanders, where immediately you see yeah, a plastic bottle. Um, but it's not until you really start looking closely that you see that there's uh, even a lot more visible. You see a plastic lid over here. You see another bottle over there and many more fragments. And, and we see that perception generally within the wider audience that it's, it's kind of visible. Everyone knows something about the litter problem. Um, and it's really uh, when we inform people and take them on a stroll along the riverbank, that people start uh, looking and the more you look, uh, the more you find and you find uh, everything everywhere really. And, um, and so, the, yeah, the more people become aware of this problem, the more they also actively uh, formulate these questions to research organizations. And uh, one of the things in, in, um, in co-creation sessions uh, organized on citizen science festivals in Belgium, uh, a lot of uh, questions actually, actually came back to really uh, come up with a mapping system that effectively maps all of this litter uh, to then being able to to inform cleanup organizations and effectively more effectively target these cleanup efforts um, yeah, to uh, to make it work uh, end to end uh, in, in such a way. Yeah. And this is really important because we actually need uh, to clean up all of, all of those plastics before they end up in, in the river. Yeah. The first slide actually uh, showed how many plastics end up uh, in the oceans daily through the rivers, but we can stop it if we can, if we can clean it up uh, at the river banks. And yeah, as Robin will probably uh, uh, concur, it's more easy to clean up once it's still on the river bank um, compared to uh, once it's already in the open ocean. And so the Waste Watchers project is a citizen science project that was um, funded through the uh, AMAI uh, channel. Uh, this is a um, Flemish um, yeah, funding channel um, promoting the combination of citizen science and artificial intelligence, making people aware, with, uh, aware of artificial intelligence and what, what, what you can do with it. And we actually try to solve um, a societally relevant question uh, formulated by uh, by the wider public. Eh? So this question came up a lot. And then we uh, contacted the River Cleanup um, nonprofit organization in Belgium to help us um, on this uh, specific problem as uh, application uh, specialists. The River Cleanup was uh, founded uh, four years ago with a vision of indeed um, preventing the plastic litter from ending up uh, in the ocean. Um, and since then, uh, they have become active worldwide. Eh? So they started just from a 10 minute uh, local cleanup in, in, in Flanders, but now they are active uh, worldwide. Uh, um, have uh, collected already over three and a half million kilo kilograms of plastic in their various cleanup efforts in many, many countries uh, world, worldwide. So they have a wide uh, network of, uh, of citizens uh, working on this. Now, we then yeah, came up with a solution uh, to effectively map the, the litter uh, using a combination of drones and AI. Now, if you go to citizens and you speak about drones and AI, um, these are typically difficult uh, uh, topics to talk about. On the, on the one hand, uh, they are very popular technologies. Everyone has heard uh, about them to some extent. Um, but the combination is still uh, raising a lot of questions and a lot of People also have um, a little bit fear um, of um, a pervasive use of drones and AI. And so there are still a lot of questions and it's really worthwhile informing the public uh, why we use these technologies. 
So why do we use drones? Um, well, very specifically, if you stroll along the riverbanks, if you go on a cycle tour or something, um, there's a lot you can see, but there's also a lot that you cannot see that is uh, hidden from your eyes uh, by the vegetation, by the slant uh, riverbanks. And it would only be if you really walk up to the litter itself uh, uh, that you can that you can see it from from a distance away. This is often not uh, possible. Um, and yeah, it's it's just uh, practically infeasible to to um, be able to uh, go in there all of the time by foot. Uh, it's also kind of dangerous sometimes to do that. So it's not really feasible. And then if you switch to an aerial vantage point. Um, these things are much, much more visible and, and uh, of course, uh, it's not always perfectly visible, but a lot better from time to time than if you do it uh, only from the ground. Moreover, if you do it from the ground, uh, then your coverage uh, yeah, scales really badly. Yeah? Also, if, when you record data with a smartphone, you are essentially recording point data. But uh, using these drones, you can actually um, yeah, cover large areas uh, contiguously. So then, yeah, the answer is using drones. Uh, the question then becomes, can you do that? Can you actually fly drones? Is that allowed? Yeah, these are just some um, excerpts from um, Belgium, Belgian um, uh, legislative uh, platforms just to show how complicated it can be at times. Uh, but the um, uh, very good thing now is that the, uh, the European regulations have been um, made homogeneous across the entire uh, European Union since a couple of years. And in fact, uh, with these small consumer drones that weigh less than 250 grams, uh, a lot a lot becomes possible now. And the wider public is actually allowed to use these drones uh, across the public territory under many uh, conditions and in many circumstances. Uh, of course, there are still uh, limitations depending on the geographic zones. But um, this now opens up the possibility of starting to use these small drones as distributed remote sensing uh, platforms. So decentralized the distributed remote sensing means um, just as you have with, with smartphones. Eh? We like to call these drones flying smartphones. Similar, uh, they are similar in price, weight, uh, ease of use, um, data quality and, and uh, uh, accessibility. So we then um, first set out to do a lot of tests on how to actually uh, do these flights. Um, you can think of many ways, automated flight planning uh, or manual flights, camera settings, uh, all of that has to be right um, in order to yield useful data. So what we did was we, we tested a lot of scenarios um, and we came up with a set of uh, instructions that were easily accessible and, and made available on our website. Um, to then inform the public um, how they could use their drones, um, how high to fly, how fast to fly, how to set the camera, etc. And we made all of that available on our uh, website and made an appeal uh, to the wider public um, to join our, uh, our project. So at the beginning of the summer, we then launched a very wide media campaign. We were featured in virtually all um, written, printed media, uh, but also audiovisual media. We had a news entry in the national tv news so we were widely covered um making an appeal to people who already have drones eh, to collect data from for us um uh, following the the published protocols but we also made an appeal to people uh, who did not have a drone yet um to yeah come over to our public fly-in days and um on those days we provided drones eh, and and uh, taught them how to do that. Um, why did we do it this way? Simply because we wanted to increase the awareness, both on the technology and the project needs. Uh, and we also wanted to uh, increase the diversity of participants, uh, because we know that uh, drones, while they are still becoming widely available, um, not everyone has them yet. And we uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, covered the wider audiences as, as uh, diverse as possible. So we had a lot of success there. Um, we uh, had over 200 participants to our public fly-in days from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of ages, um, all kinds of societal and cultural backgrounds. Um, and all of them did an, uh, a useful flight from beginning to end. Um, Close. We also had... Uh, if you could please come to a close in the yes. coming minute here. Yeah, Thank okay. you.
Cool. So we also received over 10,000 of images of uh, people who already have a drone, and in total we were able to map 50 kilometers of uh, Shell River uh, using using this technology. Um, and then that first goes to a data uh, quality check and a data processing engine on the backend on our cloud servers, uh, where we project the images and then do um, object detection. Uh, data labeling, as Robrecht said, that is also very important, of course, and uh, we, uh, for that we made contact with organizations that employ uh, people with uh, autism spectrum disorders. They really like to do this kind of work and they do it uh, incredibly well. And so all of that um, yield, yields these um, literary maps. We are still working on improved versions using the latest language models, as Robrecht talked about. But this is essentially what we do, we map the uh, uh, distribution and extent and the density of the litter as good as possible, which we then go back to the organizations to direct their cleanup uh, efforts uh, and, and yeah, use the available means where they are uh, most needed. The power of this system really lies in the collaboration um, between citizens, um, uh, local authorities and cleanup organizations that can all work together on the same type of data acquisition and processing technology. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Klaus. That was really interesting. I'd love to see that you have brought in the citizen science perspective into AI-based uh, detection and monitoring here. Uh, with the interest of time, I think we have to um, uh, collate your Q&A together with the whole panel session here. So if Dia, you could please bring up all the speakers of today on the video screen uh, and we'll try to go through a few of the questions. And so to the audience, you can still share any questions you might have in the Q&A function in Teams. Uh, we will try to get back to them, but I'm afraid with only 10 minutes left of the scheduled time, uh, I hope that uh, the speakers here today, maybe you could come back to some of the questions in the Q&A and answer, the, answer them uh, directly to some of the people here that might not get an answer in the panel session. So um, I would love to, to pose just a, sort of a more overarching question since we've been touching upon quite a lot of technicalities here. I'm not an expert technologically in this matter. Uh, and for me, uh, I just want to revert back a little bit to the title of today's webinar. So we're talking about detection, right? And we'll be talking a lot about the detection and using AI for that, the te technological capability of that. But what about the monitoring efforts here? How do we connect um, these scientific progresses and case-specific applications to make AI-based remote sensing something that is integrated into monitoring efforts nationally, uh, would it be in Germany or, or internationally at EU level within the regulatory frameworks that we have? And please keep in mind the, the EU AI Act that, uh, that has uh, quite recently been uh, came into law. Anyone that would like to start commenting on this broader question? I can, I can touch upon the last part at least. I think so. The way I understand the AI Act, it, it has it it talks about risks. So if there's a big risk for the AI failing being a problem for citizens, for example, it should be put extra effort into making sure that you have an interpretable way of doing it, or making sure that the data is uh, properly organized, etc. I, at least what I've seen today, I would argue that most of this is not high risk. So if something uh, fails, uh, it is a problem for the environment, obviously, and that's a high risk, but it does not have a high risk for, for example, society, etc. So so the AI Act is very important, but I think it's quite kind to that type of problem, making it uh, uh, very feasible to do uh, this type of detection and monitoring with AI. It doesn't put any hurdles in the way, as far as I can tell. So it becomes a big problem when you introduce human data and you use personal data, such as GDPR issues, uh, and when it has a like a risk as a part of a doctor's appointment or a, uh, that type of thing. When it's an automated system like this, I would argue that the AI Act is very, very nice to you. Right, that sounds feasible. Anyone else? Robin? Sure. I just want to comment a few things on the monitoring part. I think what you saw today are, you know, a range of different approaches to 
to the same problem, but you can see that the same problem manifests itself in river, in coastal, in open ocean. And, and in my opinion, what is needed is a real sort of integration of all these all these different methods to collaborate and to feed on each other in a good way. Um, and that can really, really um, materialize into something like a, a, a global monitoring network where satellite data, for example, is applied in its strongest points uh, where maybe we we apply our cameras in the open ocean, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think all, all of the presentation I've seen today uh, from everyone is really showing that it's moving towards that. So it's very, I'm very optimistic about it. Yeah, if I, if I might jump in as well, I, I share Robin's optimism here and I think it's absolutely critical that all, we tackle the problem from every data angle, but once you have an integrated platform, that data needs to go to the people who can make a difference on the ground. It needs to go to local authorities, you know, national government. You, you need to have this data be visible to them and to measure improvements or, or you know, actually show that a difference is being made when you when you have policy interventions. And that's very tightly coupled to, you know, the UN Treaty on Plastics. What we all want is that this data makes a difference in, in practice. And, and I think the best step towards that is an integrated data platform where the data also makes sense to stakeholders, you know, so it's not overly complex and they don't have to worry about fetching the satellite data themselves. And, and I think that's the broad aim of a lot of the different tools you've seen today to abstract away all of that, uh, that complexity, you know, to get down to the, the heart of the issue. So. Definitely, Donald, and I think that connects well to the question from Luca Nisetti in the Q&A. So he wrote, are there any ready to use litter detection systems that can be deployed in field applications without the need of highly specialized AI experts? Do you want to comment any further or was that uh, a comprehensive answer already, you think? So I think I think Robin also chipped in on on the chat there, um, and, and and I think I'll, I'll let him speak about Addis, but it, it felt to me like that that's very much the the goal of of the system there. Um, we're actively developing a UI front end as well to to display our insights for regions of interest. So, you know, as a company, we we are product focused to make it a user facing tool at the end, so that this can eventually be deployed. We're not there just yet, but that that's definitely the the roadmap for for plastic oil at least. So. Mm. Klaus, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Touching on what Donald just said, um, we are very close to uh, putting it out as as a ready to use system. So um, the AI detection. Um, once it's established, once we find a methodology that comes up with uh, sufficiently reliable detections, it, it becomes quite operational in itself. Um, the more data you feed into it, the more we can we can further fine tune it, of course, based on our, on our own internal error analyses. But once it's uh, once the AI model has been yeah, sufficiently uh, verified in house, then um, the inference itself can be operation operationalized very very easily. And in fact, that's also what we did for our citizen science project. We implemented everything on our uh, V2Mapeo cloud um, uh, processing platform, uh, ready to um, uh, yeah to to provide access um, to the wider public. Um, it, the, the processing itself is is fully operational and ready to use. Yeah. Thank you, Morten. Do you have anything to add in between here? Any new questions? So, so new, uh, not new questions, but I, at least I can comment a little bit on the previous one. So I don't know any final systems that are ready to use, but I know that it becomes easier and easier to use these type of detection systems. So, for example, segment anything as one example, where it's, you need very little AI competency to use it. Of course, it's not a ready system to be applied on an UAV or something like that, but at least the segmentation part of the AI part is, is quite easy to use, even for non-experts, which I tried to demonstrate. Right. We got a question from Joost van Dalen uh, directed toward Donald. So it's great to see the unit model applied in practice. The main concerns from the original papers are the difficulty in separating seaweed uh, from plastics. How can Plastic Eye change the model to circumvent this issue? Yeah, I think that's spot on. So I think that 
the the work I display today is is leveraging Sentinel data and at 10 by 10 meter resolution. I think Robin had a nice 2D plot um, showing where where the limitations really are at that level of spatial resolution. You know, specific object detection and an even class of object detection is a challenge. So the UNAT model is acting as a, I would say, a, a proxy model for for finding very large structures and accumulations. What we need to do beyond that is try to um, integrate either drone data, data from ships, even high resolution satellite data, um, and build a follow up pixel by pixel model where you can try to do, you know, multi class detection of the pixels that have been found within the accumulation. So we're we're actively working on that. We're also trying to integrate lab spectra, so spectra measured for different classes of materials um, and rescaling them into the, the, the bandwidths of, um, of different satellites to try and do maximum likelihood fits of, of the proportions of each class within, within a single pixel. Um, but the, the, the comment is, is spot on that um, at this spatial resolution scale, we're not talking about of multi-class yet, we're, we're doing broad scale debris detection. The, the, the plastic specificity is, is phase two. Um, and I think that's a very important distinction because um, otherwise, yeah, it can be misleading. Don't know if anyone else wants to wants to follow up there. Anyone else? Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. The last minute. We got a question here from Johanna Rud, so in salt. Uh, so she says, Klaus, thanks for the very interesting talk. Could you say anything about uh, citizen science aspects of ground truthing, validation of data? Could it also be collected with the help of citizens, for example, volunteer cleanup actions in any way? Yes, that is in fact exactly what we did. So um, uh, prior to that public campaign, uh, um, we organized uh, several uh, test cleanup efforts. Actually, uh, the cleanup action actions were done at the same time. Uh, ground truthing and validation uh, collection efforts. So we used, we appealed to students and, and regular river cleanup volunteers uh, to help us um, using a fixed methodology that we described beforehand and several tools like RTK GPS, measuring tape, uh, smartphone with an, uh, a specifically tailored uh, QGIS um, plugin app to, to record the data. And so they, um, yeah, they they thoroughly assessed uh, certain sites uh, for what they could find, and and so from these uh, sites we have a very good idea of what was there and what we can see in the images, and we can actually, uh, in in very much detail, assess the accuracy of our models. Uh, so yeah, that's definitely possible. What we are also working up on is putting all these data on um, Zooniverse uh, to increase the accessibility and help uh, get more people involved in labeling and awareness on the project itself. Uh, and so, yeah, these these kinds of things uh, definitely make part of the entire citizen science process. It's not only data collection. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm afraid that we will have to wrap up since the time has now passed uh, half past four in Norway, at least. Uh, I want to say thank you so much to everyone involved, to ICAP for arranging this event and to all the great speakers today. This was, this was really uh, something that we all can learn from and hopefully we created some new contact points. We can contact uh, each other afterwards. Uh, feel free to uh, continue answering and commenting in the Q&A uh, in this Teams meeting. And uh, you can all find the recording of this webinar on the ICAP webpage. Uh, it should have been linked in the chat window, so you can find it there. And please keep uh, an eye out for new webinars and events on the ICAP webpage, as well as new research briefs and other interesting things. So with that, uh, many thanks and have a nice Friday and nice weekend afterwards. And see you all again soon, I hope. Bye bye. Mm. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks a lot.